Hello, welcome to Legal Action. My name is David Siegel. Today we're going to be talking about lawsuits from start to finish, from the filing to the collection of your judgment. Joining me once again is my co-host Jesse Barrientes. Jesse, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dave. How are you doing? Very good. How about yourself? Not too bad. Now, Jesse, you know a lot about lawsuits. You've been involved both on the plaintiff side mm -hmm. and the defense side. That's correct. You know everything from the start of the case to the end of the case, to post-judgment, to pre-judgment. Mm -hmm. Let's start with a typical lawsuit. Pick a topic that someone would, would be suing under, if you would. Well, I think uh, probably one of the things that people are more likely to, uh, to have touched in their lives probably would be a, an automobile accident. Okay, an automobile accident right. where you have been injured by another party. Right, it could be you could have been injured or maybe it's just property damage. Um, it could go either way. I mean, that's, those are all part of it. Okay. So we could say that, hey, where you've been injured in your accident. Okay, so we have an injury case where the parties were not able to settle through insurance. Correct. There might have been negotiations that broke down. Maybe there was some liability issues or some fault questions. So we have what we, what we know as a stalemate. You have up to two years from the date of your injury. Typically, that's correct. Typically to file a lawsuit, otherwise you are barred under the statute of limitations. That's right. There are other exceptions, um, and again, you really need to get somebody you know, to talk to an attorney. Uh, one exception would be perhaps if uh, the, the person was a minor, and it would be two years after their 18th birthday. Okay. Um, but other than that, I mean, for, for general purposes, for a personal yeah. injury action, it's going to be two years. But suffice to say, there are deadlines. You want to consult with right. an attorney. You want to move relatively quickly so you don't blow that deadline. Correct. But we've got our injury case. We are going to sue that person. We file what with the court? We would file a complaint. But before we get there, too, I want to make sure that people understand, too, you know, in that interim time before, you're, you know, when you're trying to work it out with the insurance company, I would suggest that, you know, before you even do that, you go uh, and you talk to a lawyer, you talk to somebody who does personal injury. Uh, because, you know, the insurance company doesn't really, and I'm going to say this, you know, they don't want to pay. Sure. Who wants to pay? Nobody wants to pay. And there's always going to be a reason why you should get less or should not. I mean, you know, that's just the way that, that things are. So before you, I wouldn't even talk to the insurance company, to the adjuster, okay, which is the person who's going to handle the claim. Before, I would go to a, a competent attorney. And now, I would is talk this a him. specialty, or is this something that most attorneys can do, or do you want someone who specifically deals with injuries on a day-to-day -day basis? You could, you could go either way. It really, I mean, you know, there's people who do a general practice, who do a fair amount of that and other things. I mean, it could be, you just want somebody who right. is, is well-versed in personal injury. But you, do, you, do you want your Uncle Phil, who does real estate closings and collections, to actually bring this lawsuit? Yeah, probably not. Okay. So you do want someone who does injury work. Right, who does injury work. And so what you're going to do is uh, after that process, like you said, we can't agree on something. And, and so, um, you know, what we do uh, next is to, to start it all off is to file our complaint. And the complaint is just the allegations of, uh, of, of kind of what happened. Uh, for example, that, hey, listen, you know, on this day, uh, you were driving this vehicle in this direction and... On this day, this other person was driving the vehicle in the other direction, and then on this day, somebody hit you. Well, yeah, that's all part of the allegations, because yeah. negligence is what you're, you know, it's not right. something that's... Without the negligence, there's no cause of action. Right. There's no right to sue. Right. Well, I mean, we could, we, if, we, if we chose a different kind of a, a case, like a battery or something, that would be intentional. But yeah, we're talking about, in, in the case of an automobile accident, you know, primarily here, we're talking about just uh, about negligence. So, so you file okay. your lawsuit, and then you know what is happens. There, is there a fee for that? There's a fee for that, and it varies from county to county. Okay. And, so if uh, you want to avail yourself of the court, you have to pay the, the court cost. You have to pay the court cost. That's absolutely okay. true. And then you also have to serve that or send that petition, complaint, mm -hmm. to the defendant. How do you do that? How do you effectuate that, that service? There's a couple ways to do it. One way, I mean, you know, is to give it to the sheriff and have the sheriff serve it. And if the person is in the same county where you're at, that's probably the best place to, to start. Uh, I, I believe, uh, for example in Cook County that you have to allow the sheriff an attempt to do the service before you can get what they call a special process server. Uh, and you have to do a motion uh, to the court. A motion is, is a way to get the court to do something. And you're asking the court to appoint this person uh, as a special process server. Generally it's a, and I think the statute covers it, it's a, a PI with a, with a license number and everything else, people working under him too, to be able to find this person to serve him with the paper. So basically what I have to do as a server is, okay, I find you, um, David Siegel, I have a summons for you, and here you go. Now I've personally You're served. You're suing me. Right. 
You're welcome. I can't believe this. You're welcome. Now, I have a deadline that I have to respond to the court once right. I've served. Right. Otherwise, I can be held in default, and you can get your judgment without me even being present. Right. Is that typically 30 days? It is. It depends on the type of case. And we'll talk in a little bit um, about small claims, which is different than, and I'm assuming here that we're suing for an amount less than 50000 but more than $10,000. Okay, okay, so we're out of small range. claims court, right. but we're not in law division. But we're not in law division. So law division municipal. is anything over, right, exactly. Okay. Uh, pretty much, or arbitration uh, you know, in DuPage, that's what it would be, the arbitration division. So that's what we're looking at. And so that's kind of what I'm assuming for the sake of, uh, of much of this uh, uh, discussion and, sure. and this example. So, yeah, for that, it's going to be 30 days from the date that you're served. Okay. And you, you want to read it and make sure that, you know, that you pay attention to what's right. on there and... Uh, so I'm going to file an appearance. You're going to file an appearance, but what you're probably going to do is if you had insurance, we're talking about a car accident, you're going to tender it to your insurance company. You're going to call your agent. Um, what I would do, and I've done this uh, in some other, uh, you know, uh, for some other clients as a courtesy, is sent a copy of the complaint with a letter that basically said, you know, understand I, I just represent Mr. Smith uh, w for the exclusive and limited purpose of tendering defense of this personal injury accident to you. And I'll send a certified mail, so I get a green card back that shows that it was sent. And again, uh, you should probably do that certified yourself, keep a copy of everything so that you have the green card because they have an obligation then, uh, provided that you're insured there, to, uh, to defend you. Okay, so the insurance company will then hire a law firm, or typically they have a law firm on mm -hmm. staff in a particular area that handles the defense. So they will file the appearance, they will file the answer on your behalf. That's correct. Where do we go from here? We've got a petition. We've got an appearance. Right. What's well, next? then what happens? Okay. Now, now we've done that. Now um, we're into the kind of discovery phase. Discover what? Uh, well, discover. I want to discover as as a uh, plaintiff. I want to know certain things about you, Mr. Defendant. I want to know whether or not you were drinking at the time, whether or not you had any medication. There's a whole uh, bunch of what they call, you know, to discovery, it's called written interrogatories, which are questions that have been drafted and directed toward the defendant. There are standard interrogatories, which is what the uh, Illinois Supreme Court has uh, in, in the Illinois Supreme Court rules, which, which generally people use. And then there's also notice to produce, which means I'm asking you to produce various things. And then there's a set of standard interrogatories that the defendant's attorney. Yeah, I was going to say, me, I as a defendant want to know You want to know what your damages are. Sure. I want to see your medicals. I want to see your lost wages. You I want to review all of your documentation and make sure that the treatment matches the injury and that it was timely and things of that nature. Correct? Right. You want, you want my medical bills. You want all the reports. I might want to depose you. That's exactly right. I might want to get you folks. under oath, right? sworn testimony, where I can interview you about all these items, from how the accident took place, to what kind of pain and suffering you in endured, what treatment you endured, how much time you le left from work. I want to know basically all about your case and all about you, and as a person too. I want to know if there's any disabilities that you have or some reason why you can't go back to jogging or something like that. I want to know all about... Uh, the different aspects of the case that can put me at risk for liability. Well, the other thing you want to know, too, is I want to know, too, when I'm doing and uh, for the people out there being deposed, it's a deposition. Basically, it's your, you're being questioned under oath with a stenographer, someone who's taken down verbatim all the questions and your answer, and it's and under oath. And you're sworn oath. in. You're, you're under, sworn in. It's under oath. In. Exactly right. And what I also, in addition to those kind of things, I want to make sure, and basically the, the written interrogatories, those, those written discovery, is what I want to look at and to get an idea and I'm going to base my questions on what it is. And as, as a plaintiff's attorney, I'm going to ask the defendant different questions than the defense attorney is going to ask the plaintiff. The, the plaintiff uh, or the defendant wants to know, hey, um, when were you injured? How long were you injured? Did you have any injuries before? What did you do before? What didn't you do before? Uh, what happened during the accident? Those kind of things. The defendant uh, or the plaintiff, what I want to know is, hey, pretty much I'm concerned with what happened during that, you know, the, the sequence of events that led up to it. What did you do? What did you see? What did you say? What did you report? Right. You know, those kinds of things. And so once I have those, I'm going to ask those questions. And in addition to the things you said, I want to know what your demeanor is. I want to know if you're kind of like nervous and you're not looking around, you're not looking me in the eye, if you're going to be a good witness, if you're going to be a poor witness, because that's also going to help me evaluate the case. Yeah. Are and you also concerned about your client, if you are the plaintiff's attorney, as to the type of treatment, how often the treatment was, and when it was 
incurred in relation to the actual date of loss or injury? Generally, uh, well, a lot of times what will happen is uh, they'll be taken to the to the emergency room in an ambulance, and then after that they'll go to their treating physician, and maybe they'll be referred to an orthopedic, uh, depending upon the severity of the injury, orthopedic surgeon, or um, maybe it's a chiropractor, or or to physical therapy and, and those kind of things, and, and right. they'll be referred to those individuals. Now, uh, sometimes though, what I've seen is that they won't go to the hospital in, in the ambulance. They might refuse treatment altogether. They might refuse treatment, and believe me, the uh, defense attorney is gonna you know, hop all over that. They're gonna ask you those questions, you refuse treatment, but a lot of times what'll happen in what they call soft, they're, they're soft yeah, tissue. I was gonna ask you to, to describe sure. for the, the audience the difference between the types of injuries that would typically happen in a, in a typical auto accident? Well, there, there's what they call soft tissue and hard tissue. Soft tissue are things that you really can't identify that are more subjective, um, which would be like whiplash, which would be like a, your, your, your back hurting. A hard tissue injury is like a hairline fracture, a fracture, a broken arm, broken leg, busted jaw. Like something much more substantive. Sub something that you can see on an x-ray and you know see in an MRI and those those kinds of things. Uh, that doesn't that's not to say that you know uh, there's any less pain with soft tissue but in terms of proving it and it's a plaintiff it's your burden of proof uh, to prove what they say um, by a preponderance of the evidence which means it's more likely than not that this happened and, and that these are your damages. But you're gonna go in there and uh, for these, the, the soft tissue injuries, a lot of times what will happen is, uh, in a whiplash case, which means your neck goes back and forward, a lot of times you won't start to develop pain right away. It'll take uh, you know, a couple days, two, three days, depending upon the individual. Now, kind of liken it a little bit. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys out there has ever, ever worked out, right? And uh, hadn't worked out for a while, and now you worked out, and okay, you're kind of okay the, the, the first day after you work out, and the second day, and then maybe you, know, you start to feel a little stiff, you start to feel that wonderful, wonderful feeling, um, which is telling you, yeah, it's telling you that you know, your muscles are working, but I kind of liken it to that a little bit, and sometimes, that's what'll happen. The person won't experience the pain, but as time goes on, the pain will get gradual. Or maybe the doctor, or maybe some, you know, their friends, or some, you know, they'll tell them, oh, you know, put the heating pad on that, and uh, you know, they'll try to self-treat, and you know, because a lot of times people don't have insurance, Dave, and they don't want to incur those bills, and they don't want to get behind, they don't want their credit to get trashed or anything like that, and so they're thinking about that as well. Yeah, they don't want to go for treatment unless it's, unless it's absolutely necessary, and they're in extreme pain. Exactly right. And so legitimately, sometimes people won't go in till a couple of days uh, you know, afterwards, okay. after the accident. So that's one element of their damages is actually the pain and suffering sure. and the medicals. Right. Another aspect of their damages would be their loss of job, loss of, loss of income based on job loss. Right. If, if I missed uh, a month of work because the, ac uh, the injuries were severe, then I'm entitled to be compensated for what I would have had. Basically, what we're trying to do is to put me back in the place, essentially, in that respect, that I would have been in had it not been in the accident. And then, you know, you're talking about uh, also there's pain and suffering, which um, would be just what it says, pain and suffering. You know, what is it worth? It's hard to put a dollar figure on it, that, is it, it not? It really is. It just depends upon the injury and it depends upon the individual is we all have different kind of things that, that, you know, that we do and that we you know, weren't able to do as a result of the accident kind of thing. And so it just depends. It's a case-by-case -case basis. But that's also part of the equation in terms of figuring out you know, how much, uh, you know, what, what your damages are going to be. Okay. So we're ready for trial. We, we've filed the case. We've gone through discovery. We've taken depositions. The parties are far apart in terms of what's right. being offered and what's being demanded. The court sets a trial date, and what happens next? Well, before we get to that trial date, there's a, there's a couple other things, and I don't think we have enough time in our in our show to really just go through each and every aspect. But the best we can, we'll, we'll try here. Is we're not just going to take the deposition of the defendant and the plaintiff, okay? Uh, I might want to take the deposition of the officer who came after the fact because I might want to find out what Mr. Defendant what you said to the officer. Um, because you might have told me when I took your deposition something different that's not in the report. Uh, the, you know, I might want to take any other witnesses. And I'm sure the officer just loves it when you send them a notice of deposition, right? Uh, everybody, actually they do because they, they get paid regardless um, 
from from the county or from the the city or village. Right. But by the time these cases are actually oh, it's run usually two, court, three, four years, yeah, later. And what they, kind of recollection are they really going to have of what was said at the scene? The report. The report. They're going to review the report. That, okay. That's that's pretty much pretty much it. Um, but then you're also you know the other you want to take the depositions of any other witnesses. Uh, the plaintiff or the defendant is going to want to take possibly the deposition of the treaters, the doctors, the chiropractor, the emergency room physicians, those type of people. And it just depends upon the particular defense uh, attorney uh, in terms of you know what they normally do, what they usually do. So you get all that done. There's also what they call, and we'll just talk about it briefly, motion practice. Uh, in other words, once you've got all that stuff done and I have all the information, you know, I might say, hey, listen, I want to file a motion for summary judgment, which basically means, listen, you know, I have all the evidence from the deposition, from the discovery, and it shows that a judgment should be entered in my favor. That's what the defendant most likely is going to do. And then the uh, plaintiff is going to say, no, there are questions of fact, and we, you know, we can't be resolved by this motion. It needs to be trial. So there's motion practice that happens there. There's also motions sometimes that go back and forth with respect to discovery before you get to the issue of uh, depositions where somebody hasn't completed the discovery in the appropriate amount of time, or they're refusing to do that, or they've, uh, they're you know, trying to hold back, or even during the deposition itself where a question was asked and they didn't answer and they instructed their client not to answer the question. So, you know, I want people to understand and realize that a lawsuit is no little thing, especially when you're looking on this, uh, you know, with this example anyway. Right, and it lasts for several months, if not several years. But let's say we're up to the trial date now. Right. What's the next step? Well, the, one of the, the things that, uh, that would normally happen would be to set what they call a pretrial conference with the judge. So we can't, you know, we can't agree amongst ourselves. We've sent maybe a settlement proposal back and forth. You know, I've asked for fifty thousand, Dave, and they're offering five. And they're offering five. I was going to say three, but yeah, you got me there. Five, <laughs> okay. okay. You know, and those insurance companies know who they are. It's three thousand, three thousand, three thousand. But yeah, that's exactly right. right. Okay, that's what's going to happen. And uh, so you know, we'll have a pretrial with the judge, and then the judge is going to try and take us. And each judge has its own particular style with respect to that, and they're going to take us aside and say, okay, hey. I'm not going to tell the other side what's your bottom line. What are you doing? Would you know this? These are the strengths of your case. These are the weaknesses. You know what's going to cost to try it. He's going to go to the other side. They're going to go back and forth and try to resolve it. Now, if that doesn't resolve it, there's also the parties can enter into a binding uh, arbitration, which is basically the trial held by someone independent. Typically, it's a retired judge, somebody of that nature, and whatever that person decides is it. And that could be with the American Arbitration Association exactly right. or another right. mediation company? Exactly. And that's it. And, and it's all over. That's it. You know, How likely is the defense willing to enter into that binding arbitration? Sometimes they are. Uh, it, it just depends upon the strength of their case. You know, They have a lot of cases they want to get done, and uh, that's a good opportunity, especially in a case that does have more substantial merit. And you can do that at any, any time, or well, do you have to wait up until the trial no, date to go to this mediation? If, you, if you're in agreement, you could do that at any time. Um, probably it's not going to happen until after the discovery phase, so everybody has the information that they need in, in order to prepare their case for uh, either a trial or for an arbitration. And uh, so they can do it, but both parties have to agree, and there's, of course, like anything else, there's going to be costs from that on either side. Sure. Now, from the defense standpoint, there's obviously a time value of money issue, right. and they don't want to pay out until they have to. So if they take it all the way to the trial date, right. what is their incentive to settle at that point instead of just completing the trial? Well, the, the, you're right. the longer I have the money, the more interest and everything else I can collect on it and, and all that stuff too. And it really depends. What, what have they got to lose? The arbitration, and here's the thing too. When you do arbitration, and we'll step back, after you've had your pretrial, and remember I said you can do private arbitration, binding arbitration, the court also orders arbitration, which is mandatory. Is that in all jurisdictions, all counties in this I area? I believe that it is, okay. yes. And so what will happen is you'll go to a panel, three attorneys typically, and you'll put on your case, <coughs> they'll make a decision, and I'm here to tell you that pretty much nine times out of ten, or should I say 12 times out of ten, the defense uh, will reject the award. The only, you know, one way they can't reject it is, for example, if their client didn't appear for it. But other than that, they're most likely going to reject it if it is any type of a substantial award. Okay. So we're talking about something that's mandatory that you're saying they're seldom likely to accept. 
Right. Isn't this just a fruitless exercise, a hoop that a plaintiff has to jump through to actually get their day in court? Well, some people look at it as a hoop. Some people look at it as a, an opportunity to feel the other side out, to find out what their evidence is, what their strength and, and, and everything else is, because it, does gonna, it is going to take um, money to fund the lawsuit, because you're going to have to pay for the doctors uh, to come to court and, and those type of witnesses, even to depose them. And I, I guarantee you it's going to be 750 you know, 800 bucks an hour or so with the minimum amount of time yeah. to get those people in. But, you know, I don't know that it's, it's uh, I think that a lot of cases uh, perhaps can settle during that time because then the plaintiff is going to know what he or she is going to you know, anticipate what they're going to spend in bringing this to trial, and they're going to weigh that with what the what the uh, what the award was and what the defendant is going to offer. Right now, these three arbitrators, typically it's three, correct? Yes. They are going to take basically informal uh, testimony, explanations from uh, counsel as well as the client, as well as items in a 90C package. I think that's important for you to explain what that package is so the arbitrators have some information to deal with. A 90C package is basically all of the doctor reports, all of the bills and, and other things that you put together that basically come in without having to lay a foundation and introduce them. As long as you did it 30 days, I believe, in advance of when the arbitration is. Okay. So as long as you meet the requirements in Supreme Court Rule 90C, then, then you're good to go. And basically, you don't have to lay a foundation for, you know, you don't have to call the doctor and have those people in. I mean, you're still going to have your client come and testify, and you're still going to have maybe other witnesses, and you're going to question them, and they're going to cross-examine all that stuff. But as far as all the other stuff, it's going to just come in a nice little package. What happens if the plaintiff misses the arbitration for whatever reason? Are they able to set another arbitration? Can they proceed the trial, or is the case dismissed? Well, it's not going to be dismissed, but here's the thing. Uh, unless it's an emergency, and I actually had that uh, on one, it's been a long time, where there's an emergency, and I, I filed an emergency motion. Uh, it was uh, some, uh, I think it was some tragedy or something that happened in the family or something like that, and, and so we filed it, and, you know, uh, as long as that got filed and everything, you know, my feeling was, hey, uh, if the court denies it, then at least I have something for appellate purposes, but it was granted. Okay. But if the, if the plaintiff doesn't show up, you risk not being able to prove your case, and then I think, you know, if the parties don't appear, just like the defendant, you're not going to be able to reject it. Okay. So now we've made it through all this process. Right. We're ready to start this trial. We have a bench trial in this case, mm -hmm. in this particular example. We're not using a jury. We're just going with the judge, correct? Right. Okay. What happens next? If we're going with the judge and we call our witnesses and we present the evidence, we lay a foundation for our evidence. Okay. And, uh, you know, hopefully it gets admitted into evidence. And then uh, what will happen is the judge will, will look at the demeanor of the witnesses, will look at the reasonableness and the feasibility of the plaintiff's argument and the defendant's excuse. I say excuse, the defendant's defense. How about right. that? We'll use that. How many days are we looking at here for this trial? Is this a one-day event? Is it a week? Is it three days? Depends on the size of the case. In this case here, a general, a typically a, a personal injury case, probably one, maybe two days. Okay, so relatively short. You've gone all this way so you can put in another for, day or two for, of testimony to get... Right. To for a decision this, for that kind of case, right? And then let's say uh, a judgment, uh, a judgment will be or a verdict will be rendered. If it's for the defense, then the plaintiff gets nothing. If it is for the plaintiff, then it will, can be whatever the uh, the judge you know thinks in his wisdom or her wisdom that you know that it might be. Um, let's just say in our example, we're looking over ten but under fifty. So let's just say they give us forty five thousand dollars. Okay, a couple things that happen after that. Um, the other side can appeal it. What's the likelihood of that on an injury case? Probably not. I don't think it, it depends on who's on the other side, but I don't think it's really, really going to be that, that high. And it's more cost effective for them just to pay it uh, yeah. and move on. And, and to move on yeah. at that point, okay. So, unless there's some really, really good reason. Um, and then, uh, so let's assume that they, they didn't appeal it now you have to collect it. A lot of times the insurance companies, if there's a judgment, you know, they'll, they'll pay it. Sure. But what happens if I'm suing somebody who didn't have insurance? Right. And you, you have your, and now, I mean, the person's not just going to write me a check. Right. Even though there's a judgment. Right. 
They're not necessarily going to pay you. They're not going to pay you. So what will happen is we have to, so I have my judgment now, I have to uh, engage in, in uh, what they call post-decree, or post-judgment uh, post collection, collection practices. Okay. Um, citation to discover assets is probably usually the first thing and what that does I you know it gets served on the individual and he has to come in and tell me where his assets are you know where his bank account because I ask him these questions he's sworn under oath and then the the citation will be discharged then what if he doesn't show up to this uh, citation to discover assets if Can he, was, he just miss it uh, well if he misses it he risks being held in contempt because what will happen is if he was actually served personally served with it and he doesn't come up then what will happen is uh, there'll be uh, usually the attorney would ask or the plaintiff will ask that he be held in contempt. And so they will send out another notice to have him personally served. If he doesn't show up for that, there can be a body attachment, which means they'll actually go out and they will arrest him and they'll make him set a bond. And generally the bond is going to be in the amount of the judgment. Okay. So the arrest would be... Not for failure to pay the judgment, right. but for failure to appear right. at these post-judgment court dates. That's correct. So you've got to show up for these things. You've got to show up. You can't, if, if you just ignore them, you know what? Nothing's going to disappear by sticking your head in the ground, and too many people do that. Show up. Deal with it. You know what? Uh, if you made a mistake or you did something, you know what? Uh, I think you need to, you know, to just to deal with it. Yeah. Now, if you really can't pay it, if you had no insurance and there's a judgment against you, other than a wage garnishment... Mm -hmm. or levying some amount in the bank account, there really isn't much else a plaintiff can do if there are no significant assets to attach. Right. Well, what will happen, again, once you find out where those assets are, I have a choice of trying to get your uh, uh, attach, uh, you know, do a, do a garnishment. If I can't do a garnishment, uh, there's a wage and non-wage. Wage is a certain amount is taken out of your check until the judgment's paid, or a non-wage, which is I attach to your bank account. And let's say you have $20,000 in there. I get it. Um, another option I would have would, if you have real estate, would be to file a memorandum of judgment and then file that memorandum of judgment against your house. And eventually, you know, all these, you know, post-judgment interest is 9%. That's better than anything you can get anywhere. Much so, better. Much better. And then you could eventually foreclose on someone's house to collect on your judgment, on your lien. And those post-collection procedures, those would apply no matter what type of case it was, if, whether it's an injury case or just a civil collection, those same avenues of collection apply. Is that correct? Sure. Any, any type of judgment. And just, just, for the, uh, just so that people out there understand, too, and if we could do that really quick, um, you know, there's also small claims, which is anything up to $10,000. And if you do that, you're not going to have all this discovery stuff that we talked about. And the turnaround time from the beginning when you file your complaint to the person gets served till you have your trial... Mm -hmm. uh, is going to be significantly reduced, probably three, maybe four months. It just depends. And, uh, you know, you, you, you're certainly entitled to a trial uh, or jury trial at that level, too. You'll have to pay for it. But you don't, there's no, uh, without what they call leave of court, there's no discovery. And so that'll go much quicker. But the same things applies. Uh, you know, usually it's somebody trying to get maybe their uh, their security deposit back from a landlord or, or something, or, or trying to get rent maybe from somebody who skipped out, you know, there are, it's basically the same procedure except in a small claims, all of that other stuff is cut out. Okay, well thank you very much, Jesse. You're welcome, Dave. And thank you for joining us on Legal Action. Hope you enjoyed lawsuits from start to finish with an emphasis on personal injury. See you next time. Yeah, Dave, I think.